What's up painting friends? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Stuv, and today we are going to watch a time-lapse video of my recent oil painting of Grand Teton National Park. This is the Teton Mountain Range in Wyoming. And I'm also going to talk about my process for creating this painting and hopefully provide you with some tips for painting realistic mountains. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm using oil paint for this one. This is a painting that could have also been achieved using acrylic paint, uh, but I preferred to use oils just to get that rich buttery uh, color and texture and have a little bit more dry time and blending time uh, with the paint on the canvas. So to get started with a landscape like this, I always use the grid method. For some reason, I still really struggle with accurately getting proportions on mountains if I'm not using a grid. When I go paint in plain air, I still struggle with that. Just getting the correct angles, the correct height of each peak in relation to the other ones. So if you also struggle with that, then using the grid method is gonna fix that for you and make you start the painting on the right foot. If you've never used the grid method before, I have a link for one of my videos about using the grid method in the description under this video. You can click that and watch it to catch up. But basically I have a reference photograph that has a grid on it and I have a grid on my canvas and I just translate what I see from the photo to the canvas, keeping every little sketch mark in the, each little grid. Next, I start focusing on the shadows. So I filled in blue where I know I have some deep shadows in the rock and that is helping me for later on. Then I started to just paint in the background sky very lightly with my first coat of paint. I use the layering method for my oil paintings, so I will come back and work on this for multiple sessions. I had over 15 sessions working on this painting. I would estimate between 30 and 40 hours to finish this painting. It's 12 inches by 24 inches, so it's not big. I did put a lot more detail into this than I expected. <laughs> but anyway, bringing it back to the process, uh, with the sky, I get that first layer of paint down, just kind of focusing more on the shadows, not really adding too much highlight or contrast to any of the clouds yet. And then I start working on my base layer of paint for the mountains. And the mountains, are not easy to paint, especially if you have a light source to the side, like I do in this painting. It's just after sunrise time, so the sun is, you know, a little bit up in the sky, but still very far on the right side here. And it's casting these shadows on the left side of each little peak section of the mountains, and it's creating a highlight with a warm glow on the snow, and even like a bit of warmth in the grassy, sections, uh, even in the rocky sections too. So everything on the right side of each little peak is going to have a little bit of a warmer color to it and everything on the left side is going to have a little cooler color to it. So we have grass, we have rocks, and we have snow. Each of those three things has a warm color and a cool color to it. And then there are a couple little minor variations of each of those for each thing. So we have a lot of variety in our value for this painting. There is not just light and dark. There are a lot of other little mini value ranges in between light and dark. And if you want to touch up on a lesson about value in painting, I have a link for that under this video as well in the description section. You can click on that and watch it. Uh, so I'm working on those values. While we're talking about value, and you can see me starting to do more with value as we come closer to the foreground, the value meaning how light or dark something is, in the background in those mountains, the value, even though there are a lot of little variations in value, in general, everything is pretty light on the value scale because these mountains are hundreds of feet in the distance. Like they could be a mile away from where this photo was taken. I can't really remember. Those mountains, no, there's no pure black, no pure blue, no pure white. You don't want to use any of those colors when your mountains are that far in the distance. You're going to blend the complementary color in if you want to get more of a neutral color. So for example, some of my blue in the shadowy part of the snow, there's some purples in there as well. I would mix more like orangish browns and some yellow, like muted yellows in with the color to mute down that blue and purple even more so it's not super saturated. 
You could also, if you have black and you want to mute something down, you could add black and white as well. By adding like gray to your pigment, you'll make it less saturated as well, if that's easier for you to do. Uh, so I'm doing that and again, not using any pure white because the sun is lighting up these snowy sections. I am using some Naples yellow, some ochre mixed in with my white. I'm not using any pure white. Bringing it back to the talk about value, as you're moving closer to the foreground, you can see I'm using much darker, more saturated colors for the shadows at that tree line. So in the center, just under the tree, under the mountains, we have this big tree line here with shrubs and uh, like pine looking trees. That area has a lot darker shadow so we have more contrast there our value range is greater because it's closer to the foreground so we'll work on that more later as well uh, you can also see that the greens in the shrubby tree area line under the mountains that is much more yellow and golden than the anything than anything in the mountain area these trees pick up more yellows because they're closer to the viewer as I went about filling in the canvas and just covering up all the white space, I really took my time with it and focused on value and color, not really focusing as much on the details, just to get that base layer of paint down and get a general idea of where there is a shadow in the mountain and where there is a highlight. And once I got that general understanding of that, I let that layer of paint dry, came back for another section, and then I started adding some detail, adding more little tiny crevices in the snow, taking my smaller brush and adding little hints of warm to sections of the snow and the rock that are highlighted, and then adding deeper shadows in some spots to uh, create more depth in the painting continuing to look back and forth at my reference photo and then at the painting to make sure everything is reading accurately. Uh, and then every once in a while I will step away from the painting, uh, stand about 10 feet away from it and just see if anything immediately catches my eye and looks off. And then I'll come back and make an adjustment there. Usually it would be if there's like a big blob of a highlight without any shadow in that area. If my eye is drawn to that and it shouldn't be the main focus of the painting, then I will touch that up. <laughs> I would say the lengthiest part of this painting is working on the details in this mountain range. I spent a lot of time trying to get the right proportions, uh, put the snow in the right places so that it made sense, uh, read accurately and somewhat matched up to my reference photo. I didn't make it perfect to matching my reference photograph. Uh, that's one of the nice things about landscape painting is that it will still read accurately if it's not a perfect match to your reference photo. If you're painting a human portrait and it doesn't perfectly match your subject, then you got a problem. But with a landscape, it's not as big of a deal. I spent hours and days just tweaking the little shadows and uh, fine tuning where there should be some snow and where there should be some rock, uh, continuing to add more little hints of subtle colors to continue boosting the depth in this mountain range and make it not look flat. A lot of beginners, when they paint mountains, they do the thing with the value, where they make the value a little bit too dark uh, for mountains, and then they, they just have way too much contrast, uh, and it just throws the painting off and makes it look flat. Uh, so like I said before, if you make your mountains not have any pure black or pure vibrant color in them when they are mountains, seen from this far away at a distance, that will help your mountains look more realistic, less flat. Uh, another way to make your mountains look less flat is, like I said, use those other little subtle variations of color and value, uh, not making anything stand out way too much, trying to get a nice balance. If we're talking colors that I used for the mountains, uh, I used a lot of like ultramarine blues and a little bit of magenta, a little bit of cobalt blue, uh, and then like I said, mixing some complementary colors in there, so some yellows and browns, maybe some um, cool reds for the shadowy section of the snow. I blended like six different colors for shadowy sections of snow and just went around and added those little colors one day and 
uh, building up some of the shadows in certain areas and lightening up the shadows in other areas uh, in the snowy, shadowy part. And then for the warm snow that is lit up by sun, I used more Naples yellow, ochre, white, uh, maybe a little bit of Indian yellow, but not a whole lot. Uh, some flesh tint, a little bit of that in there too. So there's a little bit of pinks and warm yellows in that area. And then for the rocks that are lit up by sunlight, I use uh, yellow ochre, a little bit of burnt sienna in some places, some magenta, uh, some cadmium yellow medium mixed with magenta will make a nice warmish brown color. I use like umber mixed with white for the more neutral sections. And then for the shadowy rock parts, our value is usually darker than the shadowy snow parts, but I'm using similar colors, uh, maybe a little bit more blue and brown than purple for most of those shadows. And then, we, yeah, we also have some variations with those too. There are some really deep crevices that have even deeper shadows with more blue in the rock. And then there are some shadowy sections of rock that have a little bit more umber in them uh, that aren't quite as much in shadow as the, the b deeper blue sections. So it's a really complicated process to make realistic mountains. I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you guys, it's not easy. Uh, it takes a lot of practice, so if you're finding yourself getting frustrated trying to paint realistic mountains, maybe pick a mountain range that doesn't have a lot of snow on it uh, just to get started, or a mountain range that has full snow coverage at the top of it and has no snow coverage at the bottom half of it. Not one like this that has snow randomly scattered in all random places. <laughs> that might make it a little bit easier for you to get started. Uh, and. As we're continuing to move down, talking about the colors, but in the mountains again, we have more thalo blues, some crimson, some purple uh, mixed into the shadowy parts of the grassy area. And then the warmer parts of the grassy area have some ochre, some umber, some thalo green, um, a little maybe a little magenta. There's dioxazine purple mixed all throughout the grass as well. Basically, that, that sums up most of it. Of course, I'm mixing in random little colors here and there. Uh, not only sticking to that limited palette, I like to use a lot of colors. And then once you get closer to the foreground, if you're painting mountains and you have something in the foreground, just make sure your contrast is stronger in the foreground. You're gonna have deeper shadows, brighter highlights. You're gonna have more golds and yellows, especially if you're doing a sunrise scene like this one. I used a lot of Indian yellow, cadmium yellow, medium, cadmium yellow light and maybe hints of thalo, uh, some viridian in the trees here. And then in the super far foreground, we have the highlighted area of like the plains. Juniper, no, sage, yes. There's sage all in the foreground and there, it's illuminated by sunlight right before the tree line. And then the super far foreground right in front of you where you're standing is in shadow still. Uh, Cause there is another mountain range to your right that is blocking the sun. So you're in shadow from that mountain range and everything else between you and the mountains is starting to get lit up by sunlight. So the area with the sage that's lit up by sunlight has purples, uh, ochres, whites. Sage is not a very saturated plant. So I didn't use crazy amounts of color. I used more whites. Uh, and then mix a little bit of cool in there with my yellows just to keep it from being way too warm because sage is like a phthalo green with a little bit of purple and white. Like it's not a super warm, saturated plant. So that basically wraps up my talk on the mountains. Uh, if you guys have any other questions, or if you're struggling painting mountains and have a specific question about something related to that, then leave a comment under this video and I'll do the best I can to help you out with that. Hopefully this was helpful to you guys. I know mountains are really tricky to paint, so cheers to you for taking on that challenge. Thanks for taking the time to watch my painting process for my oil painting of the Grand Tetons. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any more of my fun painting tutorials. Thanks for watching again, guys. Have a great day and happy painting. Bye-bye.